This is Tommy Chong, man, and this is Wake and Bake with Captain Hooters. It's Captain Hooters. <laughs> Hello. Good everybody, Uder here, coming to you high and alive in outer space. Just, uh, you know, doing a little, uh, little drawing, trying to fix these meteors, you know, asteroids running around space, no color on them, you know, that sucked, can't do that. You know, there was a period of time back in the 60s, and they called it, and the people that were there, hippies. And everything was about color, and unity, and peace, and love, and doing some killer drugs. They did some great drugs back then. I'm just kind of getting my hippie vibe on here today because I have a very amazing interview coming up. Man's got one of my favorite names of all time. He's a captain. Captain Joint. I'd never heard of Captain Joint until about two weeks ago. And since then, boy, have I learned a lot about Captain Joint. This dude has been around. He was one of the original, original, original? He was one of the original freedom fighters. And he paid a big price for it. Dude's still paying a price for it. So, I'm going to be here making the universe a little more colorful. And I want you to watch this great interview. Captain Joint. And I'll be back here afterwards and we'll see what the universe looks like. Once I've had a chance to mess around with it a little bit. See you in a few minutes. Bye. Hola, hola, everyone. Captain Hooter, once again, very high, very alive, wearing my killer new relevant gear. Dude, how cool is that? I am thrilled to death today to once again having pinpointed and picked out one of the real serious OGs. And, you know, we talk about this all the time. I run into people all the time. And, you know, I did this, I did that. There's a select number of the real OGs, the guys who were there, the guys who did it. This is another one of the legit freedom fighters. Dude, I am so thrilled. First of all, let's welcome in. This is Captain Joy. How are you, sir? Doing well, thank you. How are you doing, Captain Hooter? I'm doing incredibly well, and, and, and I'm honored that we got double captains in the hizzy right now. Unbelievable. Captain first time ever. <laughs> okay, so that's my first question for you. How the hell did you become Captain Joy? Wow, there's a loaded question. <laughs> Oh, let me think on how I really want to answer that one. Do I want to be truthful or do I want to edge it? Um, <laughs> let's go with the truth. One day, a joint fell out of the sky, hit me in the head, and I became a superhero. It was that simple. Not really. No, I like that, though. That's totally Here's good. What <laughs> Here's what happened. At the age of the tender age of 16 years old, I found out you could walk into the uh, city hall in Hartford, Connecticut and fill out a permit and get the park to throw a concert. And I was always a big kid. I actually, at age 14, incited my first riot at the state capitol, but that's another story. So anyway, 
Um, I had a, a girl that was old enough, by uh, Janet Fisher, that was old enough to sign on the permit because you had to be just a little older to sign. You had to be 18 to sign. And she signed. I filled them out. They gave us the park. We started doing uh, concerts because I had a lot of friends and knew a lot of bands. And the cities, uh, at that point, their position on it was if you could just put something in the park for the inner city youth to do, we like you. We want to get them all in a park where we can watch them, you know, because things times were turbulent back then with the mm -hmm. Vietnam conflict. You know? mm -hmm. So I started doing concerts. The concerts very quickly became political. They became anti-war demonstrations. And it's about the same time I hooked up with the Youth International Party, the Yippies. Yeah. So at that point, I had attended my first smoke in and I turned the concerts political. This is a Wait. couple of years down the line now. I've been doing concerts about two years in the park. And then we started doing smoke-ins. Well, we got away with a couple of them. But then there was that one day I went in to fill out a permit. And this big guy comes in with a whole bunch of photographs of the smoke-in. And he got a, a picture of me running down the state capitol lawn wearing a big old black top hat and sunglasses and throwing a handful of joints. It was a great photo. I wish I could have had it. And they said, well, we don't believe that you are a responsible enough person to use the park. Okay. So at that point, because um, at that point I was signing my own permits too, I was old enough. So at that point I turned around, I started having other people get the permits and I took on the persona of Captain Joint under the influence of 40 hits of LSD that I did prior to the show. Holy I'll never shit. forget, man. My, my whole mind was strobing. My buddy, uh, Tiny Joe, a uh, very large, um, we always thought he was a big black guy. It turned out, a big poor black guy, but it turned out he's a big rich Indian. He owns part of the casino now. He had just enough blood to make it. I ran into him years later, it's a funny story. But anyway, Tiny Joe um, sings scat and stuff. And he would organize the shows on the weekends I wasn't doing the shows. Mm -hmm. So he organized a show with a body painting contest. And I showed up, whacked out of my gourd on LSD, painted up by Captain Joint. And if you play that uh, Johnny Stone Good song, you see those first black and white photos. That's yep. me on stage in Bushnell Park at about age 18, uh, becoming Captain Joint. And then the myth went on from there. There was a comic book, a newsprint comic book published on Captain Joint. The persona just took off. Wow. Amazing stuff. It, but it, I love the fact that it was always, it was a superhero. Yes, Captain yeah. Joint was uh, kind of the, the anti-hero, I guess, is how you would qualify um, Captain Joint. Because whereas society is the norm, may look upon him as the bad guy, he's really not. Mm -hmm. um, actually, Steppenwolf summed it up the best in their song, uh, Don't Step on the Grass, Sam. Um, there's one more guy, he doesn't count, his head and clothes are too far out. Okay. Yeah. So we okay, are so, crazy. So with with uh, you know we had Adam Brook on um, who is you know from the Hash Bash and uh, a, another one of the uh, original Freedom Fighters, and you know all of you guys have the greatest stories, and you know uh, we, we we'll, we'll get into uh, Jack Hare a, a little bit later, but you started to, you mentioned Steppenwolf. And you know, part of the really cool part about this this time frame is the access that you probably had to some of the greatest, you know, rock and roll legends of of, of their time. Do you have any really, uh, really cool close encounters with you know anybody that we would know about? Close encounters of the crazy kind. Yes. Yes. Um, there was Vince Wellnick. Um, many people know Vince was uh, the last keyboardist as Jerry passed away, but. I was aware of Vince many, many moons ago, back in the 70s. The only really punk rock band I ever liked, other than the Ramones, would have had to have been the Tubes, oh. because they were such a, a fusion of rock and punk. I mean, they, they weren't, you know. What do you want from live? Yes, exactly. And white punks on dope. Yes. Well, the way I met Vince was kind of funny. It was the um, in Maine at a Maine vocal show. Um, he was playing with a band called Jen Treadley. And they did their set, you know, of course, because Vince was um, with the dead, they, they did the dead set. And as I came on to sign them off the stage, I said, ladies and gentlemen, I want to announce you. We have Vince Welnick. You know him from the dead, but I know him for many years back to Tubes. 
and I could see him light up on the keyboard. It's like, yeah, yeah, this guy remembers me, you know? And it's like, you know, I was going to ask Vince, if you and your new friends here know any of the older songs, any chance you take a request and play White Punk Santo? Oh, wow. He gave me this great big smile. It's like, da 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 and they went <laughs> and they played White Punk Sando by request on stage. Well, later on, Vince asked me about some marijuana, and I says, yeah, I could do that. So I got him, like, some of the best spot on, well, actually, the best spot on the field, because I said, hey, this is for Vince, and people, oh, I want to impress Vince, and, you know. So I got him the best spot on the field, brought it down. He got whacked. Uh, it was Saturday night. Then comes Sunday morning. Now, Sunday morning, they had a, a trailer off next to the stage. This was Texas trailer you'll hear the if you play johnny stone good you'll hear there's a uh, dedication to tex one of the original main vocals um he passed away i actually took his place on the stage in maine but anyway it was his trailer and of course it's his trailer but everybody could you know hang in texas trailer as long as they're friends with tex unless somebody bigger than life needs that trailer and bigger than life of course in this case would be vince walnut and one of the guys comes up and goes okay vince needs the trailer and of course tex could stay it's his trailer, but he goes, you got to go, you got to go, you got to go, and as Vince is coming up the stairs, he points to me, he goes, and hey, you got to go, and I started to get up, and Vince looks up, he goes, oh no, oh no, he's got to stay. <laughs> okay, so Vince gets on the bus, and you know, it's me and Tex and Vince, I just looked at Vince, and say, hey Vince, what's up, how you doing? He goes, I'm doing like I did an eight ball of coke last night, that's how I'm doing, and I got to be on stage in an hour. Can you get me any more of what you got me last night? Mm -hmm. I said, Vince, got you covered. Yeah. <laughs> we were pretty good close friends after that. Um, he put us on his guest list when he played around me and my wife, Judy, and we, we'd go see him here and there. And we went to see him in this, this place. It was like a, a big setting, almost like a Foxwoods uh, casino type setting where they had um, all these doorways and stores on one side and a, a big stage on the other side you know? mm -hmm. and of course bands playing on the stage but there was one empty store and they were given that empty store for changing and personal okay well lord i swear i've never smoked a joint in the closet before but oh. they wanted to be on the down low so we went all the way to the back of the store in a, a damned closet and we're smoking pot in the closet you know of course you know the smoke is is like you know going somewhere we didn't know where, you know. Well, the guitarist from Jen Treadley comes running in. Randy was his name. He goes, hey, you guys, you guys, you got to stop. You got to put it out. And we look at it and we go, Randy, dude, we're like in a closet. He goes, yeah, but come here and look. And we step out of the closet and he points and we look. And they're all false fronts. And it, the, the store is only oh, like wow. six, seven feet high, whatever. And then it's open. And all the smoke was going out over the whole audience. <laughs> busted oh, yeah. yeah he told us how he used to smoke on the airplanes he would go into the bathroom and he would stuff the um toilet paper roll with toilet paper and yeah. then inhale the smoke and just exhale through the toilet paper roll he never got caught the good old days that was those yeah. were the original that was the original uh one of these the the smoke buddies yeah that's a, that's a, that the, that's what the uh, toilet paper was the first one of these <laughs> And they work, but they don't didn't work nearly as well as these smoke buddies do. So that's the, the my goodness. Okay, so so you you've done the full you did that full experience. Then you've done what a thousand different festivals, cannabis cups, uh, fairs, expos, concerts. Are there any one? Is there any one or two that just jumps to the top of your head that goes? This is still, you know, to me, the like the the coolest, best event that I ever attended. Um, that's a double edged sword. Uh, the best event I ever attended, or the best event I ever hosted. Yeah, because well, the best, best event that I ever attended would it had to have been the two thousand four Canvas Cup. Um, two thousand two. Um, well, actually, this actually ties in with the best event I ever hosted. Um. September 2002, I hosted the Boston Freedom Route. Um, had a ball. Uh, about 86,000 people by the police estimate. Okay. Um, it was amazing. We had a great time. Mm -hmm. Really did. And at that time, I, I had like a bus go off my um, front lawn that I chartered. I had another bus out of Maine from Budapest that I chartered. 
and uh, the, the, the buses rolled in and the, the thing, it, it was a hell of an event. Well, I got noticed uh, by High Times for that and also for a, a prior little something I did. And they decided I should, I had been connected, you know, with High Times with the Yippies since 1968. They started in 67. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty much, you know, original Yippie. And yeah. um, hey, real quick, while we're right there, because, you know, again, we've got a lot of kids, you know, that are that are coming up that are that are, are watching these shows. Right. And this is where yeah. this kind of, of of knowledge gets passed from one place to the next so that people understand. Um, can we discuss the difference between a hippie and a yippie? Um. Hippies generally smell better, and a yippie is just a hippie that's been beat up by the cops. <laughs> is basically how they used to sum it up. The Youth International Party. <laughs> okay, and yeah. now, commercial announcement. Yes, friends. Okay. The Youth International Party, founded in 1967, is still alive and well. If you are interested in the Youth International Party, there are books available at your local library that you can check out. This is in the time of job when Mishka was a zippy, written by Michelle Dawn St. Thomas, uh, very recent, just published last year. Um, talks about a little issue called the raid in here. We'll talk about that later. But anyway, the Yippies, um, my experience with them has been all good, I'd have to say. Um, political organizers, uh, best known, for we threw a party in Chicago in 1968. Everybody attended. Um, you can watch the trial of the Chicago Seven on Netflix. That will tune you right in. Uh, for an excellent documentary, I recommend Chicago 10. Um, there are several documentaries out, films, movies out. Uh, one is the Chicago Seven, the Chicago Seven Conspiracy Trial, Chicago Eight, and Chicago 10. Let me explain quickly the difference in all these numbers because it can get confusing. Um, originally, the Chicago conspiracy trial was eight. There was seven crazy white guys and a very serious black guy. That dude would be Bobby Seale of the Black Panthers. And since he was the only black defendant, of course, wanted to represent the uh, Black Panthers, you know, with, with some dignity. Yippies, we ain't got dignity. Actually, we're, we're down for the party. Um, dancing in the courtroom in judges' robes, bringing in Viet Cong flags. I mean, it, it was a three-ring circus. So Bobby wanted to separate himself, hence the song Chicago by Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. We'll get you to play that later. Right. Um, Bobby kept demanding his own attorney, his own attorney, his own attorney. Well, he had a dude from Chicago that was um, giving him some legal advice from the Chicago Panthers, and the judge made him identify himself in open court, and he did. And that night he was killed in a police raid. Go figure. Um, Bobby was a little upset by this, as you can understand. And that next day in court, when they again mentioned his name without him having what he considered his own legal representation, because they had refused to let him have any, um, he again went off in court. You know, I am not represented here. Uh, Judge Julius Hoffman ordered him bound, gagged, and chained to his chair in open court. When he continued to mumble through the gags and rattle his chains on the chair, they called for a, um, another pause. They took him out and they brought him in again, this time with his mouth stuffed with cotton, bound this way, bound this way. The chains that held him, it had padded with uh, blankets and towels and stuff, so he couldn't rattle him anymore. And they brought him back into the courtroom like that. So not treated well. Um, no. But anyway, that Chicago conspiracy trial, that's an interesting one. So that's that's with the eight. So Bobby wanted to remove it. So they've done other, you know, like Chicago 7 conspiracy trial, the latest on Netflix and another film, Chicago 7. They cut it, they paired him away as a defendant for the seven. So you wonder, okay, I get that. But where does the 10 come from? Well, I didn't understand this myself until I actually saw the Chicago 10 documentary. The other two were the attorneys that represented the Chicago Seven defendants, because they did more time for contempt of court charges than God. the client that they represented. Hence wow. that. So anyway, the 2002 um, rally, I got noticed by High Times, they made me a freedom fighter officially um, in the 2003 January issue, which is this one. There you um, go. You can see that. And um, 
I've always, I've gone by Captain Joint for so long that um, most people don't even know my real name. Um, <laughs> got these cool stickers. We are everywhere, just so you know. Oh, and I use cool. bookmarks. Um, but High Times did reveal my secret identity, and I'm going to show it to you here. But nobody can read it because you're looking in my camera and it's backwards. Ha, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is the issue where they officially made me a high times freedom fighter in 2003. Yeah. Um, that led to a series of really strange events. I had been getting sick and didn't realize it. Um, from 2002 to 2003, it hit me really bad New Year's Eve, which is my wife's birthday. I was doubled up uh, at the casino, Boxwoods in, in Connecticut, sick as a dog, couldn't even eat. Um, they couldn't figure out what was wrong, couldn't figure out what was wrong. January, the issue came out. Yay, High Times Freedom Fighter. Uh, March came along, and I found I had diverticulitis, ended up in the hospital um, by ambulance with a doctor looking at me going, well, boy, you've got two choices. Um, you can die, or we can operate on you. Mm. So last rites given, I went into the operation. Surgery sounds like fun. Yeah. And um I woke up on um, March 27th in ICU, or 26th, actually, ICU 27th. Um, I got a phone call in there from my daughter saying that they were raiding my house. Um, While you're on I the said, table. You know, she Fuck. says, what do we do, Dad? And I said, well, you do, you know, whatever they say, they have guns. And then in the background, I heard somebody say, who are you talking to? Who are you talking to? And she says, well, I'm talking to my dad. And then somebody got on the phone and said, who is this? And I said, well, this is Captain Joint. Who is this? And the phone went dead. Yeah. Uh, if you want to read more about that, Treating Yourself magazine, this one here um, has the issue. That's Treating Yourself 12. And um, you'll find that we are everywhere. They make great bookmarks. There's an <laughs> article called, Where is Captain Joint? And... They published pretty much word for word my accounting of what happened when my daughter called. So you can follow up on that. Let's talk about some fun stuff. Yeah. Um, you might remember um, a little incident called Kent State. Yes. Shootings there, uh, four students died. Uh, it was not a, not a good thing. Yeah, Again, yeah. protesting the, uh, the Vietnam uh, conflict. I refuse right. to call that a war as it never was declared one. Right. Uh, a lot of confusion on that. Well, when the Kent State shootings took place, people were outraged, as they should have been. Um, you know, National Guard goes on the Ohio State Kent University college campus, shoots down, kills four college students in an anti-war demonstration. And some of these kids were not even demonstrating. So at that point, the whole the country went off. Any place that could charter a bus, any church, any peace organization, and any food co-op, okay, they could afford to charter a bus to go to Washington, D.C., did. And all you had to do was get on the bus. I was young. I was like, you know, young. And I got on the bus. You know, like, what the heck? I'm, it's free. I'm going to Washington, D.C. I ain't never been. Okay, so here's how I first saw our state capitol. I uh, got off the bus. Ah, it is tear gas. Son of a gun. Um, <laughs> ran right in with the crowd. The streets were clogged. The demonstrators were running everywhere. I found my way to the Capitol building. Um, the police were coming up, over, down, chucking gas grenades at us with the guns, with the plastic shields, with the batons. I mean, they, they were ready to party. These guys were down. Mm. Um, the funniest thing, though, was they're throwing all the tear gas. They're throwing all the tear gas. And then the wind changed, and they're walking into their own tear ah. gas. We thought that was just the funniest thing yeah. as we ran away from them. But my, I spent my day pretty much ducking and dodging cops, having a good old time. People were swimming in the reflecting pool. You know, uh, it, it was a zoo. We shut the Capitol down. I mean, the streets were clogged. You couldn't get cars through. Um, and that's how people responded to Kent State. Yeah. Now let's talk about Jackson State about a week later. Say what? Yeah, nobody really much has heard about Jackson State College. The shooting is there about a week after Kent State. Um, again, 
students shot down on a college campus, Jackson State College. Well, you know, I didn't even hear about it back then. And I was in a pretty radical loop. Okay. I heard about it actually years later through the Beach Boys. Uh, did a song off their album Surf's Up called Student Demonstration Time. They keyed me in. There's a line in there. And then those Jackson State brothers learned not to say nasty things about Southern policemen's mothers. There's a riot going on. That cued me in. Wait a minute. Something happened at Jackson State. And I, I, I hit Google because the world runs on Google. <laughs> and I, I found it and I figured it out. And it's like, here the Beach Boys are singing about a state college where college students have been shot down and nobody's really heard about it. Why? Oh, did I mention those students were black? And this was the end of the 60s. Oh. And what it came down to was white students, everybody, oh my God, they shot people on the college. Black students was like, yo man, they shot some darkies. Yeah. Things thankfully have changed, but not enough yet. But that was then. And that was like, why was there not, even like the black community? I don't think almost didn't even hear about it. I know there wasn't much of an outcry. Yeah. You know, of course, back then we didn't have like what we've got now. You know, now we have the internet. Back then, when dinosaurs roamed the earth, we had three channels, four if you did the aerial right. So getting the news out was hard. We used to do it with flyers and et cetera, yada, yada. Yeah. If but Walter that was my Cronkite first didn't tell it to you. Uh, if Walter Cronkite didn't tell it to you, you didn't believe it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Strange days, dude. And I mean, you're right now. So you're you're dead in the center of the the whole movement, the heartbeat of the change that was happening at that moment. Maybe I don't know. I try to be. Yeah. <laughs> As I try to keep the finger on the pulse, and if I feel it, I get up. Yeah. I mean, did you end up going um, to the DC uh, protests and some of the? Well, being in Connecticut. Uh, I was running the, the loosely based Connecticut chapter of the Youth International Party. Uh, at one point, the newspaper referred to us as Captain Joint and his ragtag band of yippies. <laughs> All right. But um, we basically did some crazy, crazy stuff, uh, mirroring in some case a lot of the things that um, Abby Hoffman did, uh, who was the founder, one of the founders of the Youth International Party. Um, it's like he. He did the uh, levitation of the Pentagon. He, uh, they caught him outside the Pentagon with a bunch of people measuring the Pentagon because he was going to ring it with people and, and levitate it. Yeah. Um, in their minds, they did. But really, in reality, they never got off the ground because we all know that you can't levitate a building. So I decided that rather we would sink them because <laughs> at that point, we would do anything to keep the Vietnam War in the eyes of the American public, on TV, in the newspapers, no matter how stupid it was, if it brought that war to the attention of the American people, we did our job that day. Yeah. Our, our job included bombing the state capitol. We announced we were gonna bomb it. Uh, we showed up with weather balloons with bomb paint on the side, mm -hmm. bounced them off. That got yeah. TV coverage, you know? Yeah. Pretty nonviolent weather balloons. Try that today, you go to Guantanamo. Um, then the other one was the sinking of the federal buildings. If we did not have the, uh, I forget what the day was, but we gave them a target date. And if they did not comply with us and stop the Vietnam conflict, we were going to sink all the federal buildings and post offices. Yeah. We were serious, mm -hmm. starting with the federal building at 750 Main Street in Hartford, Connecticut. And the day, and we had a press conference at the Hilton Hotel. We had a table set up with a model of the federal building. We were going to do this with purple witchcraft because black witchcraft was racist. We had a witch with a cat. Uh, we had sacramental wine. We were all under 18 at this point. So I think, was, <laughs> we managed to you, get the wine. And think, we got in there. Do you think that uh, the acid and the quality of the acid during that time frame was a contributing factor? Because we know that, you know, part of the, the, the beauty of taking, you know, uh, acid in particular is it completely removes your id, completely removes any kind of fear so that you can truly uh, outlive whatever your, your wildest uh, aims and, and, and style might be. And do you think that that had something to do with maybe part of the engine that was driving you all that just said, you know, fuck it, we're doing this? I'm just going to tell you, say that if you take like three hits of orange barrel sunshine out of California, it is going to definitely stimulate your creativity. Yeah. <laughs> uh, where do you think some of the street theater came to? Oh, yeah, we're going to levitate the Pentagon. 
No, we're not. <laughs> we're going to give it our best shot. Yeah. So anyway, um, the, we had this big thing in the, in the um the Hilton Hotel, and we had the wish, and we had the table set up, and we had a hole in the table where the federal building that was set up on the table would sink through. We played a cut from Alice Cooper, a musical cut, and on cue, the federal building sinks in, in a, a burst of talcum powder, you know, <laughs> and, and under the thing. They ran it on a six o'clock news, stupid as it was. And then they came down to cover the actual sinking like it was going to happen. Okay, at this point, we had Richard Nixon, a guy in a Nixon mask with false hands made up, and we put him to a cross, and we crucified him, and we had the hands set up, and you hit the nail, and the blood spurted out. Oh, uh, crazy stuff. Uh, this, of course, was the distraction, while another group walked into the front foyers, because they figured we're only going to sink it into the ground. What more could we do? Mm -hmm. Okay, they walked into the front foyer of the federal building. I swear to God, the guards opened the door for them because they wanted to look compliant on the news, carrying a coffin, representing, of course, the, the dead in, in Vietnam. They set the coffin down in the foyer, popped it open, and threw about 100 gallons of pig's blood all over the foyer <laughs> of the federal building okay. and ran out. Um, we were quite creative in some of the things we did. Yeah, and symbolism, the symbolism. Uh, was is, was a real crucial important part of it for yeah. you guys. Yeah, you had to get the point across. Um, and each one and of did everything we could think of to do that. God. Now, did, was there at that particular time which was better, the acid or the the quality of the weed? Was there any was there any good weed at that point going around? Not in my hood. No, no I mean I grew up on Pressmex. Okay. You know, I mean, you, you buy a brick, you break it apart, you take like a half a pound of seeds out, you break the sticks out, you smoke a joint. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can name that too in one note. Yeah, I grew up in Southern California, I had the same stuff. Um, where did you end up landing? And when, I mean, after all this, this, this phrase of, it, of your life is over, now you're moving on to the next phase. Where are you at now? Right now? No, I mean um, after after that period of time. So we've we've now we're into the seventies. We're, we're starting the eighties. Just starting the eighties. Where were you at in the eighties? Eighties. Um. Oh, that's a good question. There was a lot going on. <laughs> um. Eighty two, eighty four. Uh, life was a little crazy for me. Um, I don't even know how to sum up the 1980s. Yeah, uh, there was a lot of personal turmoil, but I kept whacking away at what I was doing. I was in college. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to the Nuntuck Community College, and um, in this like '77, the end of the '70s, I had a pretty bad motorcycle accident. It took me oh. out of the loop. Uh, left leg was broken in seven places. Flew 45 feet, landed on my head, no helmet, proving conclusively you don't need one. Mm -hmm. Um. Came up looking at a badly destroyed leg that they wanted to remove. I uh, argued with them about that. Still have it with a very attractive limp. Um, but that ran me like uh, my, my last smokings in that era, I remember going to with a broken leg. And then I laid back for a little bit. Um, Was there an, an awareness? Was there an awareness yet that you were like Captain Joni? Can you really? Yeah. Uh, I probably wasn't as well known like any legend this it takes a while to establish mm -hmm. but uh yeah I was I was pretty well known as Captain Join. I think I was better known than I knew I was if that makes any sense now I mean you know I'm well known now we've got all, all the merchandising and shit yeah. Shameless promotion. Yeah, Here baby. we go. We gotta got the love the, I love that. that bad boy. I love I it. Did, you gotta send me your address. I'll send you one of these. Yeah. I put this it. out. Um, I don't know. Can I run without a filter on this show? Yeah. Because this is my fuck you to yeah. Chief Kevin P. Gleason. Okay. Yeah. He was going to jail and I made myself a bobblehead just to make the point that I'm still out there. Um <laughs> comes by the way in an attractive, attractive designer box. <laughs> okay, so you don't get you done that. It's really good. You don't get screwed oh, anymore yeah. on that. Yeah, baby. I just screw it on that. And uh, that's awesome, dude. <laughs> the actual piece 
weighs like a pound <laughs> and relatively cheap. So you're not going to find a cheaper pound of joint. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. What a great piece. That's awesome. Now, what, what made you come up with bobblehead? That was just to mock, mock the police chief? Pretty much, yeah. I decided I had the money to do it. I decided I was going to do it, you know? Fuck him if he can't take a joke. Yeah, that's what I say, yeah. But um, I don't know, the 80s, the 80s were rough. I was in college. I was um, dealing with a lot. But while I was in college, I, I did my usual. Every once in a while, I'll get this little bug up my butt. And I'll say, yeah, you know what? I think I'll charter a bus to something. Mm -hmm. So from the Nantucket Community College, I chartered a bus to go to one of the uh, New York City made AJ days. Uh, of course, back in the day, anybody that is not familiar with the history of the Yippies smoking, youth in the National Party smoking. It started out, it was May Day, J Day, National Marijuana Day. They started doing July 4th in Washington, D.C. every year. But then the May Day, J Day grew. And then it turned into uh, the Million Marijuana March somewhere along the line, mm -hmm. which I guess sounded a little more concise than the original May Day, J Day, National Marijuana Day, Rock Against Racism, and the Anti-Heroin March. Okay. It was a mouthful, but that's what the yeah. original march was. And then they shortened it to the Million Marijuana March. And then they rebranded it as the Global Marijuana March because we have, in fact, gone international, mm -hmm. um, which really struck me when I was in Amsterdam. It's funny, I was in a coffee house. I looked over at a billboard and I saw a little postcard. I've still got it. I could run, grab it, and show it to you, actually. And um, it had the uh, Youth International Party smoking artwork, which is what caught my eye. And mm -hmm. I walked over to it and the lettering was in Dutch. And that's when it hit me. It's like, so done. We really are international. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little slow on the uptake sometimes. Do you have you have you been to uh, Amsterdam a lot over the years? Uh, a couple of times. In um 2004 I was a guest judge. I had just been made Freedom Fighter and um Steve Wishna, Steve Bloom um invited me over. To, to guest at it, uh, and I had a lot of fun there. <laughs> Come here, buddy. Come here, pal. Come here. Come see me. Come see me. Come here. We got a surprise guest. Oh, a surprise guest. Love it. Come here, Jules. I don't believe you. They set you up, didn't they? All right. What's it? What's his name? Oh, hang on. Put your man on that. Oh, look at that. <laughs> That's good noodles. Oh, my God. Yeah, I'll tell you. Um, thank you for the coaching from the side. <laughs> <laughs> my daughter Charge just came in, and she says that if we're going to do this, we should do the match in half. Oh, yeah. You so got it. There you go. Now it's me. legit. <laughs> and my buddy Trippy Doodles. Trippy's like very old. He's like 14, 15 years old. Trippy Doodles. Trippy Doodle right. Bun. My right. Trippy Doodle. Oh, how adorable. Yeah, he's been my um my road warrior pet. He used to travel around with me a lot. Yeah. He's been yeah, around. He did festivals. He's older now. He stays home more now. But uh he was quite the little party dog. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's an interesting thing because my dog hates the smell. Uh and, and her name is Lady Cushy, and she hates the smell of weed. Uh, uh, most of my dogs they do they um we, should, we actually have a dog family um trippy doodles is the dad and then he, we've got his lady pandora his main squeeze she's about yeah. 12 and uh, then they, her first litter she had three she had lace and whiskey and moonshine and we couldn't yeah. keep all three but i wanted to see what a dog family would be like mm -hmm. so we kept lace little lacy lou uh she'll be nine this october and i've kind of watched this dog family, how they they integrate together, how they love together, and how they take care of each other, and it's amazing to watch. Mm -hmm. um, actually, if people go on uh, YouTube and search Captain Joint, you'll find a lot of videos I've posted of my dog's Trippy Doodles family album explains what's going on with Trippy. He's actually dying. He has um, congestive heart failure, mm -hmm. and at first we thought it was a bad cough. Mm -hmm. um, then it was a really bad cough. And we took him to the vet and it was pretty expensive to get all the testing done, but mm -hmm. it comes back that he had congestive heart failure and we didn't know if he was gonna make it past New Year's Eve. 
Yeah. Um, well, he's doing really, really well now. He's put weight on. His cough is pretty much under control. Um, to the tune of about one hundred and fifty dollars a month in medication. Wow. Uh, he's taking like, uh, yeah, he's taking three different heart pills, cough suppressants, um, wow. hip joint stuff. Um, and see, if you, you know, were a human, we would be saying, just get off all that and just get some V, man. Get some Rick Simpson oil in you and, uh, you know, uh, get yourself off all those medications. And, uh, you know, yeah, I, for I don't think they make Rick Simpson oil for puppies, though. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, they probably he, should. He, 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 uh, Trippy has gotten into some weed from time to time accidentally. Mm -hmm. Trippy has gotten into weed. <laughs> uh, one time my wife was making uh, butter. I was at a festival. I get a call at the festival. Oh my God, the dog's dying. The dog's dying. I go, no, why? what's going on? He got into the squeezings from the butter. We didn't think about it. Oh, okay, geez. what's he doing? Oh, he's just laying there. Is he breathing? <laughs> yeah, okay. Here's what you do. You lay him down on the bed. You keep an eye on him, okay? Keep water near him if he needs it. He starts moving around. He should be fine. Mm -hmm. He had himself a good buzz, but he was fine. Hey, out of all your years of seeing a billion different crafted shit, have you ever seen a great weed crafted product that was really legitimately fucking amazing? You know, I'm not talking about like a bath bomb or, or uh, you know, but like some a product because, you, you know, you must have seen thousands of different handmade shit by now. And there's some real true artists that know how to make some magical shit. Have you have you seen anything that was really truly, you know? Oh, you know, I don't know if it qualifies as art, but many many years ago, in uh, a copy of Easy Rider magazine, you know, they would feature all these crazy bikes. They featured one that the guy had polyurethane marijuana seeds to the entire motorcycle. You know, with the exception of the seat everywhere, the frame, the tank, the handlebars, I mean, the whole thing was covered and polyurethane with marijuana seeds. Whoa. Okay, so he got arrested. They were polyurethane on the bike. They couldn't use them. Yeah. Uh, that they passed being illegal when they were rendered harmless. Yeah, I wouldn't, to... I wouldn't, I wouldn't drive through Texas. And 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 push my luck. <laughs> well, quite honestly, um, my wife and I crossed the country on, on my trike um, back 2005, mm -hmm. and I specifically plotted around Texas. Yeah, yeah, good call. You know, I got to tell you, um, one of the the, the kind of surprise um, um, awareness of, of, of bonuses that uh, I picked up here in Europe, living in here in Europe for like the last 10 years, is that I, I didn't realize how much anxiety I had driving a car in the United States, in California, in anywhere, where you can, at any time, you can have those red lights go behind you and your whole life could change in like a matter of seconds. They, they don't do that here in, in Europe. That, there, that just doesn't happen. Um, you go through a toll road every once in a while, there might be a police officer there, but I mean, it, mostly they're, they're getting you for speeding uh, on any of their speed uh, things. And there's not a lot of the rest of that. And it's the lack of stress <laughs> from that. Uh, I was realizing the other day, I, 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 I don't miss that at all. Um, you know, the, I've had those lights go on and change my life. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, now that was the thing. Let's talk a little bit about that. You've had, you know, you 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 paid a, a price for when you get, you get out there and you protest and uh, you start uh, jumping up and down and 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 uh, bringing out the man. Uh, the man then comes back and uh, starts the games with you. And uh, you have quite a, a, a little a battle and it's, and it's been going on for quite a while and you're still fighting it. Well, the battle at this point, um, at least on a legal end, is over. Um, the police in Holland, Massachusetts, uh, Sergeant Scotty Haley, Chief Kevin P. Gleason, they'll, they'll never be held accountable for what they did. Um, Explain real quickly for your viewers what happened. Um, 
like we had discussed in 2003, I was made a Freedom Fighter of the Month in the January 2003 High Times. Uh, March uh, 27th, 2003, my home was raided. Um, the police claimed in, in their affidavit that I had sold marijuana to a confidential informant, a CI-62, which it took years for me to get an identity on this guy. He turned out to be a Gerald Battistoni. Um, where the police, their case didn't go well for them was on three dated, documented occasions in a sworn affidavit by police officers. They claimed I sold marijuana from my home to their confidential informant. Now on these three days, I was very sick. I was in the hospital. I was rushed into surgery. It was ICU. Um, they gave me last rites going in. Uh, there was some questions as to whether or not I was coming out. And um, long story short, I never met Gerald Battistoni. I never made the marijuana sales. I was not selling marijuana, running a drug cartel out of my home. Uh, this is ridiculous. I, you know, it, it just wasn't happening. Uh, now, Battistoni, I didn't get his identity until many years later because they chased us. They literally harassed us out of Holland, Massachusetts when they could not do anything with that raid. They, they never charged me. I was never charged. They put out a, uh, a press release to the newspaper saying I was charged with uh, selling glass pipes. I was, but I was never charged for it. Uh, they said I was charged for uh, selling marijuana. Uh, I didn't make those sales. I was never charged with it. Um, it all went to magistrate, um, Massachusetts Commonwealth. And the magistrate decided they didn't have enough to charge me, specifically when my lawyer, Stephen Epstein, who started Mass Can Normal, um, pointed out to them that um, I had not made the sales because I was in the hospital. Magistrate yeah. said, well, then we're not gonna charge him for something he obviously didn't do. Well, a year and a half later, after the raid, um, my da a daughter stars an interesting little child. And, uh, she's had some issues in her life and she went off with a, a couple of the local Holland cops. Uh, they were trying to catch her and she's yelling piggy, piggy, piggy at one of them. And they, they got the cop chasing her in the woods yelling, piggy. she was a kid. You know, and the other cop looks at my wife and goes, aren't you ashamed to have a daughter like this? And my wife looked at this guy a year and a half after the raid. She goes, aren't you ashamed for working for the most corrupt police department in Massachusetts? And she tore him a new one. Oh. So this guy, he went off, blew the dust off the case. Now, the chief of police was nowhere. So he blew the dust off the case. This rookie decided that he was going to bring um my wife and my daughter up on charges from the raid for simple possession and he did this opened the door for our civil suit because what happened was the judge of course they want discovery they want evidence they want to know something actually happened chief um kevin p gleason and sergeant scott e haley could produce nothing they had no bags of weed they had nothing they produced a badly put together evidence trail okay, of paperwork that was not even proper. And so in August of 2005, our civil, you know, our, our criminal suit rather, um, my wife and my daughter was thrown out of court. It was dismissed. Mm -hmm. uh, this opened the door for us to do a civil suit, which we mounted. We were actually in Amsterdam um, at the hedonism. Long story. Um, when Hedon we got the news, great spot. Yeah, when we got the news that we had, um, you know, beat the case because the judge had told us, because um, he had been appraised of the fact that the sales never happened, um, told them that they did not even have to be in court. So they weren't even in court. We were in Amsterdam when, when the charges were dismissed. We, we had a ball. We just danced through the naked people at the hedonism and said, yeah, this is life is good. This is great. Um, at that point, we figured we won the anarchist lottery because how could we not, not win this case? It's all cut in stone. There's no doubt the police perjured themselves and the affidavit to get the warrant. There's no doubt the raid was completely illegal. Now, their confidential informant that I ne never met, Gerald Battistoni, was a whole nother mix of a different ball of wax, okay? Um, when um, there was a detective, Dan Malley, that, that finally gave me his name and said, sit on it because there was more. When Battistoni actually went into jail for serial child rape, uh, at the same time he went to jail for that, um, it was announced that he was the primary suspect in the Molly Bish murder. It's a 16-year-old 
uh, girl, a lifeguard oh. that went missing off her, her job in the first couple of weeks of her job, she's gone. Oh. Um, they found parts. She went missing in 2000. They found parts of her in 2003. Oh. Um, it was a sad story. And he was uh, exposed as the primary suspect by Dan Malley of Worcester, Mass. Uh, the same time this happened, he allegedly cut his throat in jail and was put away in the mental health facilities and kept there. Wow. So nobody could talk to him. Um, the police are throwing red herrings all over the place on the Molly Fish case. Uh, there's a long story there. Uh, they went to Florida 2009 to question uh, a guy named um, Rodney Stanger, who uh, he's doing time for decapitating his girlfriend. He's not a nice man. But they decided that he is not a person of interest in the Molly Bish case in 2009. Now, in 2011, when Gerald Battistoni was pointed out as the primary suspect, the FBI, uh, the detective Dan Malley, and the Molly Bish family all asked the state police, the Massachusetts State Police, to test the DNA picked up at the Molly Bish scene, specifically in regards to Gerald Battistoni. So the police immediately jumped into action lost the DNA, sent more cops to Florida to again question Rodney Stranger, and have done everything they can to this day to cover up Jill Battistoni as even a suspect that they're looking at. Now, if you Google Molly Bish, M-O-L-L-Y-B-I-S-H on YouTube, okay, you'll start coming up with Jill Battistoni, right tagged to Molly Bish all over the place, okay? If you read the Kim Ring articles in the Telegram and Gazette, disgusting stuff and you'll there'll be no no doubt in the pit of your stomach Jill Battistoni is the killer if you watch the most recent one a couple of years ago came out open cases with Paula Zan you won't hear a word about Jill Battistoni and this is supposed to be a recent update but the state police were very cooperative with, with her in making this so-called updated documentary it's basically exploitive uh tv news crap um, she did nothing but recap a bunch of old crap in an exploitive way uh, for ratings. And she didn't even put up, you know, half the truth about it. There's a serious, distinct cover-up going on with the Molly Bish case. And the only reason I am this involved in looking at that child disappearance, well, one, I, was, I moved into the area in 1997 um, when the first girl disappeared with a Holly Peranin. In 97, they found parts of her in 2000. Molly Bish in 2000, they found pieces in 2003. So I was living in that area when these horrors were, were going on. I had kids Whoa. this age. Holy you know, God. I was my worst nightmare. And then yeah. they used this guy on paperwork as a CI, put him that close into my home. So I've been watching the Molly Bish case and tracking it. The DNA evidence tracking is ridiculous. The police lost it. And then when Molly would have turned 30, her sister Heather Bish raised hell. So they found it and then they exported it to Texas for faster testing. Well, it never came back from Texas, but then they found more DNA on an old cold case because they're going to test with new stuff. No results. There, I've worked with private detectives on this that have contacted me. I've worked with cold case workers that have been threatened. I've been threatened. Um, state of Massachusetts wants the Molly Bish case to go away and wants my raid case to go away. They put the super lawyers mm -hmm. on Dude, me. I gotta tell you, just oh, like yeah. listening to this, this is a fucking movie, okay? It's a you movie, did, did, it's a book. It's a documentary. It's a documentary. Yeah, right yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, you know, you should, you need to get on the scribe and 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 get that all on, on paper. You've got it all in your head. I mean, it's 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 quite a story. And and, it's it, and and I mean, I did a little research after, you know, I got a little ahead of this story a little bit and I started doing some research. And I mean, you you were talking about that guy uh, cutting his uh, cutting himself in, in the thing. Yeah, I mean, there's there's all kinds of little other side notes to all this. All there's there's wormholes, I guess, is the, 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 the story. It's crazy, dude. There is. Yeah, there is it, a lot of side roads throughout. Yeah. It's it's um, the the fact that you're uh, you know a, again uh, persevered and uh, and and survived is is a testament to to you and and the power of Captain Joint. Let me ask you another question: Is there is Captain Joint a dabber? Is Captain Joint like dabs or uh, just joints or pipes? Um, or... Joints, bongs, dabs, edibles, dimension joints. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, pretty much any way I can I get marijuana in. Um, but while we were on the, the subject of the raid and Captain Joint's perseverance, as it were, of it, again, I'm going to bring up in the time of Job, when Mishka was a zippy. Um, in this book, this, this is the, the first of two. There's a companion, a companion book coming out called Ride the Sky. And these books, this one touched on the raid. Ride the Sky is going to go more in depth on the raid because, um, well, I, I had an interesting friend over the years. His name was David Peel. He passed away in 2017. He was one of the first yippies I met. And um, one of the wormholes that you're talking about in this would be when David Peel came to Massachusetts in 2003. Because if anyone out there of, of your watchers knows the, the legends of David Peel, he was always New York. Uh, May Day, J Day, National Marijuana Day, Million Marijuana March, Global Marijuana March, whatever you want to call it, David Peel was at the forefront in New York every year, except 2003. Because I organized in Green Hill Park um, the Global Marijuana March. I brought it to Massachusetts that year to Green Hill Park. And I organized it from my hospital bed. I was having a lot of complications from my diverticulitis. That year I had four surgeries, almost died. I was literally on life support on uh, that Global Marijuana March day. Uh, the doctors weren't even sure if I could be there to run the event I organized. So I called my friend David Peel. And I explained the situation to him and said, is there any possibility, Dave, you could come to Massachusetts and you could, you know, do this show, either host or co-host with me. I'm not even sure if they'll give me a pass to go to it at this point. And he says, give me a minute. Let me think about it. I'll get back to you. About a minute later, my phone rings. He goes, you know what? You tossed me 75 bucks for a bus ticket and I'm there. So David Peel, who John Lennon sings about, David Peel is pretty well known showed up and crashed on my couch, visited me in the hospital. He brought me a CD called The Mass Grass Revolution um, with his Orange International copyright and a whole bunch of his songs on it. I think it's the only copy of it in existence. Um, I've sent it to the West Coast Youth International Party. Uh, They now have a copy of it and they've documented it. Um, And he gave me some other CDs of his stuff, came to visit me, and I was actually given a pass to go to the event. So here it is. My family rolls me into this event in my Captain Joint outfit with the big old hat and the, the shirt. And I'm in a wheelchair and I, I've got a, a post with like about four different machines and pick lines because I couldn't eat and feeding lines. And God bless that medication line. You know, with the morning. <laughs> and I was doing pretty good in my wheelchair and doing all right. And I did go up and, and speak from the chair and, you know, co-hosted with David Peel. And I had set something up with David Peel. My family wasn't aware of his, and I a stinker. Um, David Peel says, now we're going to have Captain join up and we're going to do a song he wrote. I pulled the pick lines real quick. I got up out of the wheelchair and I went up on stage and I did my song, Johnny Stoned Good with David Peel and the Mustangs. Everybody loved it except my family. They were pretty upset. They slapped me back in the wheelchair and my wife had been helping. She thought she had done all the pick lines right, but we're out in, you know, in the middle of a park. Okay. So everything's not maybe quite copacetic for being anesthetic and being clean, you know, antiseptic and all of that. So it ended up, I got about three blood infections for getting up on the stage and doing my song with mm-hmm. David Peel. And in retrospect, I would do it again. <laughs> Dude. But that was the circumstances that uh, brought David Peel to Massachusetts in 2003. And that's documented in the book, Ride the Sky, currently uh, in the works. and will be coming out, mm, I'm not sure when, probably late this year or early next. Um, I'm mm-hmm. also doing some cover artwork for it. So, you know, I'm and slowing do, them down, I'm sure. Do you have a main website for where that will be launched? Um, I do not. Uh, you know, I do a lot with different publications and things. I'm not really that savvy on the computer. Mm-hmm. To be honest, I don't know how they got you in that little phone. <laughs> <laughs> if if people are following you on like, uh, is it would would FaceTime be better or Instagram or um, Twitter or 
I'm hard. I'm I'm hard to follow. Yeah, actually. I, um, I I keep doing stuff, and it, it keeps like if you search Captain Joint on YouTube, yeah. you'll find out what I've been doing, and you might find out what I'm up to. Yeah. Um, there's, not, <laughs> there's not really a way to, to follow me unless you really follow me. I do have a Facebook page. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. My real name is David Bund. Um, and if you want to really search me out, there's a whole bunch of David Buns out there. It's B-U-N-N, -N, like the coffee baker. Wish I had a piece of that, but I don't. Um, <laughs> you'll look for a picture of me standing with Brian O'Halloran from The Clerks, because I'm in uh, Chasing Amy with those guys, holding up um, a big yippee flag. It's me and Brian holding the flag up, and over us is the space monster from Frankenstein Conquers the Space Monster. <laughs> uh, it's an easy website to find if you know my real name. David yeah. Bunn, that's Captain Join. Sign on. I'll see you on Facebook. Uh, you can follow me if you try to sell me things. You can tell me that you're a, a prince and you want my bank statements. You're not going to get them. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, you know, I do have a Facebook. Interesting enough, I did just lose a Facebook. They had an awful lot on it. Um, and really? my, computer, my computer has been attacked a few times with oh. um, twice with child porn. Once shut down by Microsoft, they went through my emails, my my banking information, and everything else. They cleared me of anything. I'm not into child porn, thank you. Yeah. Um, but then my Facebook page was targeted with child porn, and Facebook they don't help you. I, yeah. I you know they give you a chance to um, appeal. Well, the appeal is you send them a letter. Well, I sent them a letter saying I obviously did not do this. You have a sign in from an Android phone. You can probably track who put this on my Facebook page and you can probably do something about this. Yeah. Well, no, they simply never restored my Facebook page. So I lost decades. Yeah. Um, I lost photos of me with Afro man. I, I lost photos of me doing all different shows and, and festivals and body painting. And, you know, it, it's lost. I lost. Yeah. I trusted Facebook. Don't trust Facebook. There you go. You know, what I meant that you, 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 again, you mentioned some of the, uh, you've been around a ton of celebrities and people and, and all these different events and everything. Did any, uh, anybody ever surprise you and show up with just the killer, killer, killer bike? And you went, oh, holy shit, didn't expect that. Um, yeah, that's happened. And I've surprised, I've surprised them with killer bike. It was kind of funny. Uh, I mentioned Afro Man. We, we met Afro Man in, um, there's a, uh, a venue in Harmony called Freedom Field. And uh, a group had sponsored a show at the Freedom Field and it was the, the Can of Carnival. And uh, they had Afro Man in as the guest. I get around and meet people pretty quick. So I had met Afro Man prior to my friend Chip on security trying to shoo me away from him mm -hmm. uh, when I was walking up. Because uh, Chip, I've known him for years. He goes, hey, uh, Captain Joint, you know, I'm sorry, but part of my job here is to to keep you uh, at arm's length on this one. I said, oh, okay, Chipper. Hey, Afro Man, when you're done, like we talked about, come on over, we'll get you baked. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and Chip just threw his hands off. This is the same guy that told me, no, I can't drive a go-kart at one of the yeah. shows, one of the golf carts. And five minutes later, I'm riding by waving at him with yeah. one that somebody I just, I do what I want. But anyway, uh, me and Afro Man and my wife, Judy, and his wife, Nicole, and, and my daughter, Christina, uh, we all sat down by our camper and Christina had grown some really, really fine marijuana that year. We got Afro Man baked on it. And Ooh. we talked to him a little bit. And his song, um, you know, Because I Get High mm -hmm. came up, mm -hmm. which I personally kind of liked, but I saw it as kind of a parody. You mm -hmm. know, well, my wife is very opinionated, Judy is, and she saw it as beyond parody. She saw it as insulting to stoners. Uh, you know, I didn't clean my yeah. room because I got high. Well, I cleaned my room when I was high. I just didn't remember, you know, yeah. and I'm going to be a quadriplegic because I got high and, and she took offense to it. Mm -hmm. And she talked to Afro man about it and he kind of got it. And it surprised me because it turns out that he's done a remix, a clean version. Right. Of, he did uh, a clean you know, I Marijuana for my glaucoma and I got high. And at the end of it, he's got a link to the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws which by the way, I also support and have since the 1970s. Uh, Keith Strope, I know pretty well from you know introducing him on stages and I, I blindsided him a few times, we've had some fun. But yeah. um, normal and the yippies usually oil and water because mm -hmm. Keith had said back in the day that the one thing, his worst nightmare was the 
image of the long haired, wild eyed youth smoking dope in the streets. Mm -hmm. And that was his quote. And of course, um, we are the Yippies. We were those wild eyed youths smoking dope in the streets at, at our festivals and the Global Marijuana March and the 4th of July smoke in and anywhere we happen to be actually. Yeah. So we, we were as well, but Keith and I get along because you know, there, there's two different ideologies working in the same direction for the same thing. We were guerrilla theater, shock theater, keep it in the news and be crazy. And you need those lawyers to balance things out. So we had Keith Strop and Normal and the lawyers, and then we had the yippies and the crazies, you mm -hmm. know, and each needed the other. It's a very symbiotic relationship. I mean. okay. And I supported both because in 2000, uh, in the 2000s, let's just ballpark it. In the 2000s, uh, my wife, my daughter, my son-in-law, myself, we were all on the board of directors of Mass Can Normal, which is Massachusetts National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. This yeah. was when the raid took place and I was, you know, the, the um, Boston MC for 2002 and brought Arlo Guthrie's son, Abe Guthrie's band in, Xavier, to play and softened up some of the heavy metal stuff, you know, because mm -hmm. that was too much. I mean, we had to like balance that out. But anyway, um, in, in, in the 2000s, um, Board of Directors, Masky and Normal, and I'm Yippie. That's an anomaly because mm -hmm. we never really, the, the two didn't really like, but we kind of, for some reason, I, I mesh and I mix with both. And that mm -hmm. was what got me into Maine and to Foodafest because, you know, I, I'm the crazy working with the suits. Well, mm -hmm. the head suit, Steve Epstein, comes up to me. He goes, hey, CJ, listen, there's this event in Maine and they want us to send someone to speak and none of us are too comfortable. And we're wondering if you might want to go. Oh yeah. And I says, well, you know, what's the event? And he goes, well, it's called Foodafest. And I said, sure, you know, what's the spin on this? And he goes, well, it's fully undressed dancing activism. There's gonna be nudity there. <laughs> I thought about it for a minute. I said, I'll take my camera. I don't yeah. mind talking to naked people, <laughs> it'll be fun, you know? And so in 2001, I went to, um, the Fuda Fest, my first show in Maine. And uh, it was a lot of fun, interesting. I got on really well with Aaron Fuda, uh, who has an interesting story. Um, his father actually was the first guy to get arrested for streaking uh, at college. Really? He was like, yes. And he, Aaron just carries on the family tradition. He's naked on his bongos every year at this thing. It's a riot. Streaking? But, um, <laughs> that was in the 70s. Wasn't that the 70s? Yes, was, his father yes. was the first streaker to get arrested in the college. <laughs> wow. And, uh, okay. This, this year, um, Somebody has to be first. <laughs> well, this year, uh, July, uh, the weekend, July 29th, is the 20-year anniversary of the 2002 Food of Fest raid. Uh, 2001, I met Aaron. 2002, I came on as the MC of his show. And the show got raided. Uh, oh. It was... Awesome. I can only say it's the most fun you can have with every single branch of law enforcement that you can imagine. They had the gang unit. They had the border patrol. They, they had the Boy Scouts out there. Right? They had Barnum and Bailey. They had guys with fully automatic weapons on top of Aaron Fuda's double-decker bus. Well, there were titties. There there were... The double-decker purple bus. It's got a Chevy van, I think it is, welded the, to the top. There were boobies so out there. Level. That's why. Uh -huh. There were boobies out there. That's why. Uh, I think the boobies had the machine guns at this point. Yeah. Um, but they had people <laughs> up on Aaron's double-decker bus leveling fully automatic weapons on a crowd. Mm. Uh, my experience here was I had just come back from doing a stony ride in town and got some food and was cooking some burgers. And I, I looked over the side of my tent. This guy steps around the tent. And it's like he's in full camo. He's got the face paint. He's got a fully automatic weapon and he smiles at me. So what do you do when somebody with a fully automatic weapon smiles at you? You smile back. Okay, my wife was sitting off this way. And um, our younger son, uh, Cougar, comes up, very young. He goes, um, mommy, mommy, there's guys here with guns. And she looked up and she looked over and she saw the guy smiling. And she looks down, she goes, oh, it's okay, honey. It's Aaron's friends. They're doing the puppet show. Because this was something Aaron would do. Mm -hmm. But then our older son, a little bit older, Danny comes up. He goes, Ma, Ma, look again. Those ain't no fucking paintball guns. And she looks again and she realizes, ain't no mm -hmm. fucking paintball guns. 
-hmm. And as she's realizing it, I'm looking past the tent and I'm seeing like all these hippies, some of them naked, running out of the woods with all these guys with guns coming up behind him. And it's like, yep, we're being raided. Now I had invited Roger Leisner from the main indie news to this show. I told him it's fully undressed dancing activism. Of course, Roger, that rang in boobies, bring the camera. We're badass guys, we are. Sure. So he did. And what was he doing? But he was taking a picture of my friend Amber getting her boobies painted when his friend said, Roger, we're being raided right now. Roger stepped back from uh, this big rock, okay? Mm -hmm. And Amber's being painted over here. And he steps back and he looks down the Fuda Road and he sees this cop walking in with a badge swinging. Mm -hmm. He took a picture. Roger had a very intimidating camera. He had a lens out to here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he took a picture, ducks back to the rock, hides his pipe, hides his pot. Okay, and then comes out shooting. Mm -hmm. He covered the entire freaking raid. If you go Fuda Fest Raid 2002, mm -hmm. F U D A F E S T Raid mm -hmm. 2002, you can mm -hmm. pull up all of the photos prior to the raid, after the raid, mm -hmm. during the raid. Mm -hmm. They're a riot to look at because the cops came in. There was a school teacher there. She was experimenting with nudity for the first time, and they would not even allow her to put a shirt on during the raid. They walked her with about 300 people naked down to the main road. Well, yeah, um, public indecency. That's the, they're, they're, yeah, that's what they do. They, no, they, do they couldn't yeah. arrest her for it because she was legal on his property, and they coerced her down the road. They would not allow her to get dressed, so mm -hmm. she was not arrested. But she, you know, this, this, it's one thing if a woman wants to be naked. It's mm. an entire different thing if you force her at gunpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the cops should have been brought up on charges on that one. I think they should have allowed her to put a shirt on. Yeah. You know, but, shenanigans yeah. takes place a lot out there, you know? Yes, yeah, what... yes. Yeah. The raid was a riot because the police, they, they went through, they, they couldn't find a bag of pot at a pot show. They found like a bag of joints in uh, Aaron's shirt pocket inside his bus and all the money he had collected, you know, for the festival, which was about $2,000 to pay the bands and clean up and stuff. Not a lot of money. He doesn't really make money on his festival. He does it for fun. It's a right. three-day festival. He Right now, the price is up to 25 bucks. I think. Find wow. that somewhere else. I dare you. So it's more of a party. It's a family party. Mm -hmm. So they busted him for a bag of, uh, bag of joints. They took all his money. Um, they busted a, another friend of ours, Farrell. They found a few mushrooms, um, not even enough to get high on in her van. And that's all they could find. Mm -hmm. Were there no drugs there? Ah, uh, hell yeah, there were. <laughs> Where did people hide them? In the garbage. Yeah. The cops wouldn't go in the garbage. Yeah. One of them, Aaron had like old couches around a fire pit. One of the cops looking all macho and shit, right? He walks up to the couch. He puts his hand down into the couch. Ooh, that's disgusting. We looked at him. It's like, dude, the couch has been there for 10 years now. It's mm -hmm. old. It's moldy. What did you think you were going to find? <laughs> uh, so anyway, after the cops left, uh, about a thousand people poured in and the party continued that night. And you'll see the, the pictures of like the fire with the girls dancing up on the rocks topless. And, you know, it, it just rocked. Mm -hmm. uh, before the raid, after the raid, and we had pretty good fun with them during the raid. Now, right after that, because there's a lot of festivals in Maine, they had Hempstock, um, and they had the Great Hempstock Raid. 2002 was 2002 was dude a, another raid a raid year. They they just kept playing with us, um, and it was interesting what happened at that one because you know I, at that point I had replaced Tex on the stage. And I, I was working pretty close with the vocals. I was vending glass, although my glass got taken out of there quite quickly when the cops came rolling up with warrants. Mm. Um, my experience on this one was pretty simple. I stepped out of the porto potty the same time my buddy Larry did. And Larry goes, man, I'm glad I didn't step out of here smoking my, my pipe. I looked at him. I said, so Larry, why are you glad you stepped out of here not smoking your pipe? He goes, look down the hill. I look down the hill. There's police cars. Don't know how I miss this. Um, they're raiding the glass vendors. Mm -hmm. They came in with warrants specific for the glass vendors. I looked down at my tent. My wife's sitting at the front. She threw me a little wave. And I see my kids coming out of the back of the tent with all my glass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's like, they're, they're huffing it. Okay. 
So our area was clean. We had nothing uh, by the time the cops came to check us. And my son Cougar, anybody would give this kid a key. He drove choppers, all kinds of stuff, tractors, John Deere's. And they'd give him a key to drive anything. Well, at this point, he's driving one of their garbage wagons and he's driving around or throwing bags of garbage on the wagon. He's driving off and driving back and I'm watching him. And I signal him over. They go, Cougar, it's great. You want to clean up here. You realize that we're being raided, right? And he goes, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm doing? I says, no, what are you doing? He goes, remember the food fest raid where the cops wouldn't look in the garbage? I said, yeah. He says, we got all the illegal stuff up here we're covering it with garbage <laughs> you go boy <laughs> <laughs> you know i feel bad i you know it's like you you very unjustly obviously had to get to get you know all endure more than is what is necessary but at the same time it kind of was necessary and to have people like you fighting against the power in order to kind of prevent the shenanigans from happening again, right? And you know that's yeah. that's that's where you know we all have a we all you know have a, a a debt to you and and thank you for 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 fighting these battles because you've been fighting your ass off, dude. And it's you know it's one thing to be uh you know the good the happy good part about being Captain Joint, but. You know the responsibility of being captain joint it was another another price you know and um you know much respect and uh, and you know freedom fighter squared i guess is what you would say it's uh you got a couple of extra uh, extra ones on there what's what's going to be next for you what's gonna what's coming up what events do you have coming this year and um well uh july weekend of july 29th 20th anniversary of food fest i'm going to be there mm -hmm. um Harmony has a new show now. I think it's the second annual. It's called Glow Hard. It's uh, EDM music, um, electronic dance music. Yeah. And I've got a lot of friends on that scene. Yeah. So I'm going to be checking that one out. Are um, you an EDM person? Do you like um, EDM? You know, let's just say I, I enjoy the overall flavor of the shows more than I do the music. Uh, the music to me appears somewhat repetitious. Yeah. I'm more, yeah. you know, old time rock and roll. Yeah. There you go. Um, okay. And I'd have to say that my my favorite performer, my alibi actually, is Alice Cooper. And the reason oh. I call him an alibi is because on um, October 30th, 2002, this is a funny little wormhole on my story. Okay. Um, October 30th, 2002, my wife and I decided to disconnect from the phone, from the social media. We're going to the damn Alice Cooper show. We're going to Foxwood, damn it. We got tickets to the Halloween show of Brutal Planet, okay? With He was there with his daughter, Calico Cooper, who he introduced as his own little nightmare. Mm -hmm. My wife and I had a great time at this show, at the hotel. We unplugged. We left our home in Holland, Massachusetts. We had a pretty good time. And then the next day, the next day after the Alice Cooper show, I called my daughter from the hotel. I said, so... We had a pretty good time. How are things for you? And she goes, well, dad, an hour after you and mom rolled out of the driveway. Well, he was the oldest living member of Masky and Normal at that time. George. I love it, man. So you are descendant of the descendant. The, the, um, proper, the proper leaf from the yeah, tree. My, my lineage actually goes back to... Um, to Abraham Lincoln um, and to Daniel Boone, who until I saw my family tree, thought I thought he was a fictional character. Yeah. Um, but I'm related to Daniel Boone. I'm related to Abraham Lincoln. Um, I wonder I, what kind I, I of guess, weed. I wonder what kind of weed Abraham Lincoln smoked. He must have had some killer bud. I uh, probably not press mix at that time. I think they were growing their own. Yeah. <laughs> no, I bet you. I bet you there was some shit. They they had yeah. something. Uh, they were probably pairing it with a really good uh, uh, a mash whiskey that they also made out there in Kentucky, right? Ooh, mm, good stuff. Yeah. Kind sir, thank you so much for taking the time today. You know, uh, I think that thank we're just having. we're just kind of scraping the surface, but I think we've got a really good kind of a feel now for for kind of the journey that you've been on so far to get to this point. And uh, you know, again. Uh, this is exactly what I'm looking to do because I want 
the next generation to understand, you know, there, things didn't just happen this way. Things, people had to pay a price and, and people had to fight and go and continue to fight, even when they said that, you know, a, a thousand times that this is the wrong direction. You had to keep going and keep going back and keep going back. And that's how the advances were made. And, uh, you know, again, that's, that's a, uh, again, we, we all owe you a debt and, and thank you so much. And uh, I, I can't wait to see, uh, I've got all kinds of editing to do to add pictures to all the great stories that we talked about. And uh, I, I do have some great booby pictures also, everyone. So I just want to let you know, you know, rest right. assured that we've got some, some beautiful artwork. <laughs> so my current plans, um, like I said, um, working with the West Coast Youth International Party through their publications of um, like in the time of job when Mishka was a zippy covers a little bit of the raid that gets it out to the public. Uh, the next book, Ride the Sky, will cover a little bit more of the raid that gets it out to the public. Um, these outcries I'm doing, uh, my blogging and my Facebook, um, I am looking actively for a documentary filmmaker and I am putting my marijuana politics everywhere I can, even some places where you might not expect to find it. Like one way to follow me is I've been writing for this magazine, uh, this is Midnight Magazine. It's a fanzine that started on Facebook. Uh, a friend of mine, Eric Wright, uh, runs um, a Facebook page that uh, is, you know, basically horror movies and horror comic books and horror publications. And um, this magazine spun out of it. And even though it is a non-political horror zine, well, this non-political horror zine covers the randings and the ravings of Captain Joint. And um, I, I've covered like uh, Brian O'Halloran and Clerks and um, marijuana and comic books. And uh, I keep just putting the word out there about, you know, our movement and who we are and what we do. And I just mix it in uh, and I find, you know, legitimate ways to present it to a public that just might not catch it somewhere else, anywhere else. Like, you know, if you could talk about marijuana politically, if you're talking about Weed Wolf comic books, you know, the bog, the bong monster from the slime comic books. Get away with that. But I've been writing for uh, Midnight Magazine, Midnight Tales. Uh, I've been writing and doing artwork for uh, West Coast Youth International Party. Um, I'm continuing to work uh, the main scene to just keep the word out there. And the reason that we're working so hard on the things that we're writing is because our history is being digitally erased by the man. And we all know who the man is, kill Whitey, what can I say? Um, so we are documenting ourselves and we're doing it in ways and places that we almost have to sneak in our history, like Netflix, Trial of the Chicago 7. It's a docudrama, it's our history. You didn't learn that history in school. You'll learn it on Netflix, okay? Chicago 10, great documentary. Again, you didn't learn that in school, you know? Um, the Day the 60s Died, documentary. That's about Kent State, you know, you, you didn't, you're not learning this in school. They're digitally erasing us and we are finding ways to keep our history alive. Like the song Chicago, you know, by um, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, Four Way Street. It starts out, so your brother's bound and gagged and they've chained him to a chair. Won't you please come to Chicago just to sing? You know, our kids are listening to this and singing it and our grandkids, in some cases, and they don't know who that guy was. They don't know who was bound and gagged. It's the words to a song until they look into it and they find it's our history. The song Ohio, Tin Soldiers and Nixon Coming, we're finally on our own. You know, Four Dead in Ohio, it's like our history is in our music. You know, the Jackson State, Kent State with the Beach Boys, our history is in our music and has been since Woody Guthrie, you know, and beyond. Um, we're documenting our own history through our own media because the government is trying to erase us. So I guess my goal now is to document and to get a, a new, hopefully a new batch of freedom fighters out there because um, it was like 2004, I was in um, San Francisco and Wavy Gravy and Woody Harrelson, a bunch of people. And Wavy Gravy got up on the stage and spoke. And one of the things that he said was that we needed to get some new revolutionaries out there, some new radicals, because 
us old radicals are getting old. We're dying off. And if a new generation doesn't come and pick up that gauntlet, well, you know, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. And we've got to be eternally vigilant to keep our freedom. Because what just happened with Roe versus Wade? Oh, yeah. People didn't pay attention anymore. They took it for granted. Mm -hmm. Think about it. Yeah. Peace, my brother. Yeah. yeah. Love you. Thank you so much. Uh, you totally rock, and uh, I'll obviously link uh, to everything. And uh, we'll be back in touch. Yeah. Well, I'm surprised that we had not heard of each other before. I think <laughs> that we have found our evil twin. There we I'm go. Just, uh, evil? No, 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 no. Our, our symbiotic co, uh, co karmic twin. No, okay. no, we're, so we're on the same. Yin and yang. We're kind of a yin and yang. The a yin and yang, yeah, but the po it's, yin all yin yin. it's all positive energy. It's all positive energy. See, it's all going that way. Yes, my the friend. logo for this show. If you could do it up, you should do a round yin yang, mm -hmm. but do a yin and a yin, both sides like tie dyed. Okay, yeah. with your face in one of the dots and my face in the other one. Fuck me. Who okay, there you go. Going to work. Here's your show you symbol. Work <laughs> It's been Peace. great meeting you, talking to you, and I think I'll be seeing more of you. I'll Absolutely. be asked about uh, my summer. One of the other things I'll be doing, edit this in, one of the other things that I'll be doing this summer also is I'll be checking out Higher Education, a uh, show in Maine I've not checked out before, but mm -hmm. um, this year my friend Uncle Stoner is going to yeah. be there. He's doing a squash off there, and uh, he's bringing me in as one of the guest judges. Oh, so shit. I'm going to once again come in and serve. I am actually one of the judges for the Amsterdam event that's going to happen. So I'm just going to tell you right now, I've uh, witnessed a few of these. Uh, you better hold on to your uh, britches. It's going to be a bumpy ride. <laughs> Not for me. You know, I've smoked marijuana yeah. all my life since yeah. I was about 14. Yeah. And I've never smoked a cigarette. Yeah. Now, yeah. Where, where this hit, this is funny, because where this hit, <laughs> was a few years ago, I had a test for COPD. Mm -hmm. And I had mentioned it because they, they ask you, do you smoke? I says, well, I've never smoked a cigarette. Mm -hmm. At this point, I, I'd smoked marijuana like 45 years. I said, I've smoked mm -hmm. marijuana 45 years. She goes, sure. really? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll be interested to see how this test comes out because mm -hmm. I have a teenager interested in smoking pot. And okay. I, I'm just curious. All so right, when I went back to my test results, the lady says, you know, um, your lungs test out cleaner than somebody that's never smoked anything. Perfect. Are you a, are so you a big dabber? Um, not so much a big dabber, but I've done a, a good share of a lot of them. Mm -hmm. uh, like when it's available, mm -hmm. I do it. I don't stop. Yeah. Uh, when marijuana is available, I do it. I don't stop. Can't um, wait. I can smoke pretty much go. anybody under the table. Oh, I, I love it. it. It's, my, it's my superpower. I can yes. make marijuana disappear. Ah, there we go. Now we've come into the same realm of where uh, Captain Hooter came into play. Because when I first became Captain Hooter, that's how I became Captain Hooter. It was who was the one that could smoke that big giant bowl all in one hit? Who's the one that could finish off that joint? Who could roll? Who could do? It was always the whatever nobody else normal human could normally Who's going to take the whole gravity There you go. When are you going to come out of the plastic bag? Yeah. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> They said it was impossible. This is a job for Captain Hooter. Exactly. It's been oh, my I, honor, sir. I can't wait to talk to you next time. And uh, uh, we will uh, we'll, we'll wrap this one up and uh, uh, smoke the good stuff, man. I'll see you next roll time. Roll that wrap it. Yeah. We got it. Thank you much, <laughs> Captain Hooter. Awesome, man. Well, hey, welcome back, everyone. What did I tell you? I told you there's stories there. That well goes deep as they say. Quite an amazing man. Anyway, I have so much respect for him and thank you so much, Captain Joint, for coming and joining us here today. All right, everyone, I think we're on our way. Oh, wait, there is one more thing. Hit it. Hello smokers and vapors, Herb here with a new bud report and today I have something really special because I am going to talk about one of the 
cup winners for the High Life Cup 2022, which is one of the better and uh, oldest uh, cannabis cups in Holland. And today we're going to discuss the first prize winner in the Kush category, the OG Kush number 18 Special Reserve by coffee shop Daisy Duck in Den Haag. And I can tell you right now, it is a winner for a reason. Let's start with the look of the bud. Because in the beginning, when I saw it in uh, the wrong light, in a little bit of a dark uh, uh, room, I thought I saw uh, some botrytis, you know, some bot rot there, because it had a lot of brown spots in it. But that was only at first look, because when I uh, looked at it with the right lighting, I could see that it actually was a deep purple U, which is uh, something that you see in a lot of bud and doesn't necessarily have to mean that it's a bad thing. It's a temperature thing. So it's absolutely not a problem and it was definitely not bud rot. Let me just say that. Because if I opened the bud after that, uh, I, saw that the, I saw that the branches and the calyx were all beautifully fresh green and it looked really crisp. The bud structure itself uh, was very open and fluffy, and I liked that, and it had the nice kind of stickiness. So all in all, the bud looked great. Trichome heads were beautifully opaque and milky, so that's another thing you really want to see. That gives me the impression that this bud indeed, as they call it, a special reserve, has been cured right. All in all, uh, Daisy Duck in general, in is a really good coffee shop. They really know what they're doing. They, they appreciate good quality cannabis and they want to give their customers the best quality possible. One of the things that I really like about this coffee shop is that they actually test all their products. They have it analyzed by a professional lab and they have a report on every bud they sell. We're going to take a look at that in a minute. But first I want to talk about aroma. So as you can see, I ground some up here. I always do that to let all the terpenes uh, um, come out. Oh, immediately you get this sweet, flowery and spicy aroma profile. Yeah, this is most definitely a uh, hybrid edging towards the BLM spectrum because most of the sensation I get stays around the, the lower area of the nose. So already a prediction. I'm pretty sure this is a very sedative, calming bud. Okay, so next to that sweet, flowery and spicy aroma, I also get a woody, musky undertone. And in the high notes, there is this, this uh, piney, almost grapefruit kind of finish. So I think it definitely has some terpenoline and pinene in there, but we're going to take a look at the analysis report in a moment and then we'll really see, I haven't even seen it yet. So I'm really hoping to see a lot of uh, carophyllene, a lot of uh, linenol, Probably also some uh, terpinaline, maybe, or uh, definitely some uh, pinene. So I'm really uh, um, curious what the analysis report says on the terpene profile. So let's take a look. Okay, first of all, let's focus on the THC and CBD ratio. I can also see that they have all the other main cannabinoids in there, like CBG and CBC and CBL. Um, yeah, THC total active is 17.9, is almost 18% uh, THC, which is kind of the average here in Holland. Um, CBD is 0 0.1, which is also uh, fairly average. There is a lot of CBG in there as well. And that's, I think, about it for now. It's 22% of total cannabinoids in there. Now, of course, let's look at the terpene profile because that is the most interesting part, I say. 
Okay, so first we can see that uh, beta carophyllene, uh, there's a lot in there. There is almost 1.4%, uh, sorry, 1.4 uh, milligrams a gram. And you usually don't see more than 2.0 uh, when it comes to uh, one particular terpene in a profile. So uh, 1.4 is actually quite high. Second highest is pinene, uh, alpha and beta. So I got that one right. Um, myrcene, I didn't really get, but I guess that explains the muskiness. Then they don't have a lot of other ones. The one, oh, yeah, well, there you go. Uh, linanol, there's a lot of there in there. Also 1.4, that's quite high. And humulene, I didn't really get that, but it could also be that woodiness and a little bit of the muskiness there as well. I did have a lot of typical uh, Kush forced floor kind of smell, like a fresh damp forced floor. Not surprised of what I'm seeing here in the analysis. Um, let's just quickly go over contaminants and it looks like that all passes. So not only am I happy that I'm seeing this analysis, I have learned uh, again that the nose knows and that this is a really good bud if you just look at the data. I can't say any more about this. It was a first place winner for a reason, and I am going to enjoy this immensely. Um, that's it. Uh, again, this is the OG Kush number 18 Special Reserve from Coffee Shop Daisy Duck in Den Haag. And I suggest you definitely check them out if you are in the neighborhood because they are on point. Shout out to Daisy Duck. Okay, guys, that was uh, my bud report, and I will see you next time. Thank you for listening. All right, thanks everyone for joining me again today, and we will see you next week with a brand new Wake and Bake with Captain Hooter. Ciao for now. <laughs> it's Captain Hooter.